y'all doing? Well, really quiet. Oh my goodness. Oh. Sometimes it's like I get up here and I swear you guys were napping the whole time during those, during those songs. How are we all doing? It's been a very joyous day, has it not? It's been like really exciting. We've hung out. We've uh, had a lot of baptisms, uh, which is exciting. We've had some confirmations. Uh, we've had some dedications. It's been a beautiful Sunday. Um, yeah, I, Ben has said it. I've only been here for about a year, and I used to work and go to Baptist churches, and they all, you know, had a lot of tradition and a lot of things that were great about them. But one of the things I've loved about coming to Lakeview and being a part of this community has just been the diversity of worship and the diversity of how we can all come in and be witness to so many sacraments, so many celebrations. Um, it's just beautiful. This morning, uh, we're going to be jumping back into our generosity series. And I'm going to be honest, uh, we don't have a lot of time. So I'm going to be kind of in a sprint, uh, but more of like a happy jog for me, uh, which I can usually do quite well. Uh, if you ask me to run too fast, so I get pretty red. Um, so we're going to not try and have that happen this morning. Today, we're going to take a few minutes to talk about two words that Jesus calls his followers to be. Um, if you have your Bibles, I'll get you to turn with me to Matthew 5, 13. We're going to be reading until verse 16. It goes like this. You are the salt of the earth. Or, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm in the right spot. It goes like this. Whoop, let's try it again. You are the salt of the earth. The salt of the earth loses its saltiness. How can we be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If you weren't with us last week, or maybe you haven't been here the last couple weeks, we're in this series called Join in Generosity. And last week, Paul kicked us off really well by opening up the Sermon on the Mount and jumping into the Beatitudes. And what we took away from what Paul was teaching uh, was that Jesus was speaking uh, and teaching very ordinary people. And we will also remember that Paul helped us identify the word blessed, makarios, uh, which came with the connotation of blessing for those who feel inadequate. And this inadequacy for the original listeners uh, would have come from the feelings that the world was designed and prioritized for those who were powerful and lived abundantly. But what we saw in the kingdom of God that Jesus presented uh, to his audience was not about power, but it was it was shown that those who were poor in spirit, those who mourn, and those who made peace, those who lived as they had little, those who felt inadequate, those would be the people that would see God. Those would be who theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so now, these ordinary people who are gathered on this mountain on the, and are sitting here listening to Jesus, are about to hear two more words, salt and light. And these next passages don't live exclusively away from the Beatitudes. Uh, really, if we were to look at them, we would see that they're pretty connected and almost as a unit. Jesus expanding on something he was just teasing out in the Beatitudes. Peacemakers, merciful, the pure in heart. Jesus was alluding to and showing the believer as a witness, the believer who revealed God to the world around them. So although our modern Bibles would separate and almost put these two passages, the Beatitudes and salt and light, not in the same grouping, they're actually really all together, uh, just like, you know, most of the whole Sermon on the Mount. D. Eric Carson sparks, speaks on it like this. To see how this works, we must recognize it is impossible to follow the norms of the kingdom in a purely private way. The righteous life you will live will attract attention, 
even if that attention regularly takes the form of opposition. In other words, the Christian is not pure in spirit, mournful over sin, meek, hungry and thirsty for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, a peacemaker, all in splendid isolation. These kingdom norms, the Beatitudes, diligently practiced in the sinful world constitute a major aspect of Christian witness. In a simpler way, those who are blessed because of their inadequacy, as Paul put it perfectly for us last week, don't find these blessings by being a peacemaker or merciful on their own or to themselves. The implications of salt and light means that everything that preceded these two words from Jesus needs to be done publicly. It needs to be shared with others. And it needs to come from having genuine faith and revealing transformation that God is doing in us. And this is really revealed in the language that Jesus used to describe how this witness plays out. Salt, halas, is pointed out by many commentators as being a preservative. One commentator compared salt to today's like modern fridges and freezers. I don't know about you, but my youth pastor brain, 27 year old, was just thinking about how Jesus was standing there on this mountain and he just said, you are the whirlpool refrigerator. Doesn't sound as good, I don't think. I think salt is a lot better, but all the same. When it comes to being a follower of Jesus, as the world becomes even more harmful, a place of moral and spiritual decomposition in many ways, followers of Christ, through being salt, delay the moral and spiritual decomposition around them. And they do that by living out the Beatitudes that we just read about, that Jesus listed 10 verses prior. They do that by evidently living out their faith they do that by pursuing generosity in the world around them. But Jesus doesn't end there. He also says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. I was driving down to Regina last week to see some in-laws, nieces, and nephews. And back when I was at Briarcrest, going in Karenport, going to college, I got taken down memory lane. As you would be looking for something to do because you lived in a town of 500 people, you would obviously go to Regina. But as you pass through Moose Jaw, the first thing that you would see is this big, ominous glow from our province's capital. And as I was driving down last weekend, I had kind of forgotten this image, and I was thinking about this sermon and thinking about it. And I, I remember we got past Bethune, and we're just like a little under 100 kilometers out. And the sky just lights up with this big glow coming from Regina. When I think about what it means to be a city on a hill, this metaphor that Jesus gives his followers reminds me of this. Just a glow, clear enough to see from hundreds of kilometers out. When we think about the way uh, that we live and show the evidence of Jesus' impact on our lives, do you think it can compare to this type of life? Like, I had thoughts about it. Like, do we actually display our faith this brightly? Does it actually come off this clearly? It's a tough question to answer, and I don't know what a fair comparison would be to humanize this example, but it almost feels as if we were talking about walking into a coffee shop on a Saturday morning, and simply by the way you walked up to the counter and ordered a coffee would reveal something different in you to the barista standing on the other side. It's kind of close to what I feel like is being talked about when we're meant to be light. It's meant to be so evident. It's meant to be so clear that in the littlest ways and in the littlest parts of our lives, it should be evident that Jesus is making an impact in our lives. 
The second part of this metaphor features this allusion to a light on a stand, a light that can be seen from anywhere in the house. I think many of us can visualize that one light that we have, that we keep on in the dead of night in our house. That light, for me, at least, helps me not tripping down the stairs when I'm going to go get a midnight snack, you know? I just walk out, and I'm like, Alexa, lamp, turn on. Thank you. And then I slowly make my way down for a sandwich. But we have all traveled through our house in the dark, traveling at a whopping 0.001 kilometers an hour, skimming our feet along, not trying to trip on anything. And that is the darkness and the cautiousness that people often walk their lives in. However, when we are quick to put our light on a stand and reveal a generosity that Jesus calls us to, when we show those things that Jesus has mentioned in the Beatitudes, well, we reveal a different way to live rather than the cautiousness and the darkness of life. We can turn on that light, walk down the stairs, and not worry about stubbing our toe. In Messianic prophetic writings from Isaiah, Jesus is revealed as a light to all. Isaiah 9-2 writes, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, light will shine. Jesus then takes this message and presents it to his followers as well, right? That's what we get when we get the light passage. And in light of dark and a decomposing world around us, we are to be witnesses of Jesus' work and reveal the transformation that is happening in us through showing his justice and care for all, going out and being generous. But what might be the most challenging for many of us to hear out of these metaphors um, is what happens when we take these things that Jesus has taught us so far and we do nothing with them. The passage uh, goes like this. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. This might be hard for us to glance, or to grasp at first glance, um, but it pulls us back to D.A. Carson's quote. If we're meant to be salt, we cannot become a part of the decomposition of this world. We could do that by doing exactly as D.A. Carson's quote tells us. In doing all these things written in the Beatitudes in splendid isolation, not responding to the kingdom of God that Jesus reveals. And that light might be hard to hear because in the second metaphor, Jesus also says that we are meant to be light. Lights are meant to be on a stand, not hidden under anything. And this is a warning to us because as followers of Christ, we are meant to confront evil in ourselves and in our world. These two images that Jesus gives us shows us that we can proactively become a part of the decomposition. I want to lead us into our landing today. Um, just thinking about if we are to take what Jesus wrote in the Beatitudes seriously and realize that the kingdom of God is here and that it's for all, it requires a response and a transformation in the lives of us as followers. And specifically today, it means that we must become salt and light. Practically, that means living a generous life. I love how Eugene Peterson's paraphrase closes this passage. It goes like this. Keep open house. Be generous with your lives by opening up to others. You'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. And this reveals to us the generous undertones of our series. That the kingdom norms, as Carson writes, should be a part of what we demonstrate to the world around us. Should we, be, we should be first to offer a helping hand. We should be the first to comfort those who mourn. We should be the first to jump towards peace 
and we should be the first to be merciful. Ultimately, in our lives, generosity has to shine like a light in your life. In your daily walk, be the first to jump towards generosity. Be patient in the Starbucks lines. Don't cut someone off in the church parking lot. And keep repeating Peterson's words. Keep open house and open yourselves up to others so they will be prompted to open up to God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. God, um, yeah, what a beautiful morning to spend um, seeing you at work in so many families' lives and so many individuals' lives and being witness to the fact that your work keeps happening. And we see that through confirmation. God, I pray that as you are doing work in us, that we would see the things like the Beatitudes, that we would see the opportunities to be salt and light in our world, and that we would step faithfully into the generosity that you're calling us to. Put us in your name. Amen.